on this week's episode of Marketing O'Clock. We talked about the new commercial and Snap Originals. Shopify has a new app called, you guessed it, Shop. We find out what's lurking in the back of Greg's photos. Shep talks about Arthur George Kardashian socks. <laughs> and the U.S. Surgeon General shows us how to fold napkins. All on today's show. Marketing O'Clock is your weekly dose of digital marketing news. A proud part of the Search Engine Journal Podcast Network. We record every week from the Cypress North Studios located in beautiful Buffalo, New York. Tune in to our critically acclaimed Famous Friday News Show for insights, updates, rants, and much more as we cover the full gamut of digital marketing for you. If you want to follow along, just check out our show notes or head over to marketingoclock.com for all of the links from today's articles. And please subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Hey there, I'm Greg Finn. I'm Christine Zernheld. AKA Shep. And I'm Jess Bud. And it is officially Marketing O'Clock. Here on May 1st, 2020. Remember, you can catch our famous Friday news show each and every Friday morning. All your digital marketing news from the week. Powered by the digital marketing community. Join us in the conversation. We're at Marketing O'Clock everywhere. So what's going on in, in y'all's quarantine? Doing good? Doing well? Yeah. What's happening? As well as I can, um, I tweeted today that it is week seven, and I still don't know how to spell quarantine. <laughs> yeah. I also, coronavirus throws me off. I always wanted there to be too many A's in there, but there's a lot of O's. Yeah. I mix up an O and an A in there sometimes, too. How about you, Jess? I just go with COVID. <laughs> yeah. You can't mess that up. <laughs> no. Stay away from COVID. Don't go too COVID, well, Jess. Yeah, go I mean... the other direction. <laughs> As far as what to type. And quarantine, yeah, I my favorite thing about it is that everyone has kind of accepted that we're calling it that, even though it's really a lockdown. Like, you're only in quarantine if you're being quarantined, but we're all just calling it that, and I like it. It's more fun to call it a quarantine. It's just harder to spell. I agree. All right, Jess, who are our sponsors this week? This week's episode of Marketing O'Clock is brought to you by Ahrefs. Whether you work for a big brand, run your own small business, or do freelance work, getting traffic to your website is always an issue. Ahrefs is an all-in-one SEO tool set that solves that problem. It gives you the tools you need to rank your website in Google and get tons of search traffic. Want to learn more? Check out their blog or YouTube channel for step-by-step -step SEO tutorials. And they have a seven-day trial for only $7. That is a dollar a day. Head on over to ahrefs.com to sign up. That is A-H-R-E-F-S dot com. And today's show is also sponsored by Optio. Optio helps Google Ads managers automate time-consuming manual tasks so they can spend more time on high-level strategy and creative work. Optimize accounts, monitor performance, track budgets, and get alerts when important changes happen. And right now, our listeners can get a six-week free trial of Optio. That's one week less than how long we've been in this quarantine shop. Wow. You can get six weeks only if you go to optio.com forward slash S-E-J. That is O-P-T-E-O dot com forward slash S-E-J. Like some empty joke. Do you plan these ahead of time? <laughs> well, I just kind of flow off the tongue. So thank you to our sponsors this week. We're going to dive into some features on how you can use these tools to help you in your daily life. And week seven, week eight, week nine, week 10 of the quarantine, or however long it takes. And first up in the news this week, Shopify launched a new customer shopping app, and it is called Shop. How creative. Wow. But it should be really called Track because it's mainly for tracking packages from Shopify merchants and other retailers. I've already used Shop. Oh, you have? Love it. This week? I love it. I use it today. I bought hot sauce. Yeah. So... You can follow brands that you like that are on Shopify, and you can also browse a feed of recommended products based on those brands that you follow. I didn't think it was super easy to just search for products, but Greg, did you have an easier, like, did you just search hot sauce or did you look for your hot sauce brand? I guess I didn't really use it the way it's intended to. I just got to a page that showed shop on the page and I'm like, oh, I'm going to try this, see how it works. So I was on a site selling hot sauce. Yeah. So and, it seems like if you're into your brand and you just want to buy something, it's great, but like searching products isn't great. Probably not, but I bet that that's going to get a lot better. Um, and the other thing that's very, very nice is that Shopify experience from purchasing like repeat purchases is phenomenal because you don't have to 
put your credit card information in. It's almost like Amazon in a way that's segmented out. It makes it really smart and easy for folks. So again, I've never been on this site before. I have been in buying things on Shopify. They've got my information saved there. I've got a little pin. I can put it in and I don't need to enter my credit card. I can pay instantly. It's very nice. Yeah, that's nice. I guess my favorite stores like the fas- fashion companies that are terrible for the world and I just shop at them anyway aren't really on there. But I found it interesting that Skims, Kylie Skin, and Good American are all on the app, but Arthur George is nowhere to be found. What do you guys think? That was the, my first thought. I was like, Skims, check. Kylie Skims, check. <laughs> Americans, check. <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, where's Carrie's George? That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> I just want to buy Rob Kardashian's $14 socks and they're nowhere. So wait a minute. It's going to be a no for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, for me, dog is a new option for advertisers from Snapchat called First Commercial. And First Commercials are a non skippable ad that can be shown on Snap Shows. They last for six seconds, and the buy-in for them is a 24-hour shelf life. There was a great write-up over on Search Engine Journal from Susan Weingrad. And it's only available right now through direct sales, but will expand in the future as programmatic. There isn't anything that they had released yet on the price or you know for the different placements. But got me thinking, I'm not a big Snapchat user. No, I want to know. I didn't know. know they had shows. I didn't either. So I looked up, and they have almost a dozen original shows on Snapchat. So I have six shows. Some of them are made up, some of them aren't. And you are going to guess which is real and which isn't. First up, Endless, starring Summer McKean and Dylan Jordan. After an emotional breakup, Summer and Dylan are finally moving on with the next phase of their lives, separate from one another. But when career opportunities bring them both to New York City at the same time, does fate have a different plan? What? That is endless. Um. Next. Influence Her High, starring Rosa Lux and Ava Sapel. At Crestville High, things operate a little differently. Cheerleading captains Rosa and Ava have more than pep, as they have all the pull as the school's biggest influencers. How will they use their power throughout their final semester at Crestville? Okay, and that's Influence Her High. All right, next up, Life Sync. And this is spelled L-Y-F-E, sync, one word. In this unscripted original series, each episode features the trials and tribulations of digital first couples yet to meet in person, tracking them for 48 hours. How will they react when digital and physical worlds collide? (laughs) So we'll do another one here called Commanders. In this comedy, two teenage outcasts discover a mysterious code within a retro computer that can alter real life. When they decide to use this newfound power to disrupt the cliche social structure, their high school will never be the same. I can't. I can't with these. Are we guessing or are there more? One more. There's one more. And it's called Danza 4L. (laughs) This story follows Ralph Kimmelsworth, a 15-year-old with an unhealthy Tony Danza obsession. His (laughs) on-the-rise girlfriend... Darla Cumberbunch has had enough. She thought they had hit the bottom when Ralph began to only recite lines from Who's the Boss? But when he leaves to track down the IRL Judith Light, things turn from troubling to criminal. (laughs) Okay, so what's real? Endless? Life's think is real. Is only one real? You tell me what's real. Endless, starring Summer McKean and Dylan Jordan. Influence her high. Life sync. Commanders. (laughs) Or Danza for Al. I think life sync is real. Okay, Jess? I think it's a trick question. I think they're all fake. Okay, they're not all fake. So wow. you're out. Danza for life is fake. Definitely that fake. Is. That's the only real one. No, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> Endless starring Summer McKean. Is real. Real. Shep, got that one. Influence her high. Fake. Fake. Jess, oh, I just gave the answer away. <laughs> Well, you told me I'm out, so. Oh, yeah, you're out. <laughs> and then Commanders. I don't remember that one. Two teenage outcasts discover a mysterious code within a retro computer. Oh, real. Real. Okay. Which one would you watch if you had to watch one? Tony Danza. For sure. 
Stands up for Al, actually. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love like, that Judith Cumberbatch or whatever her name is. She's my favorite. No, that was the that was the on the rocks girlfriend, Darla Cumberbunch. Yeah, her. <laughs> she's my favorite character ever written. She's like a literary icon. <laughs> What's next, Jess? <laughs> Why do people listen to this show? Who knows? <laughs> All right, next up here, for folks that are running Google Shopping campaigns, you better strap in because this next piece is going to knock your socks off. It comes from Sir Stephen Johns, a.k.a. at Stephen Johns 21 on the Twitter machine, and he spotted a new type of audience targeting for shopping ads, and that's affinity audiences. So for 21 those, got another one. He got another one. And for those that don't know, in Google's words, affinity audiences are made up of users that, quote, have demonstrated a qualified passion in a given topic. So pretty good stuff, and it's definitely applicable in the e-commerce space. So great news for advertisers running shopping campaigns. You guys have nothing to say about knocking knocking your socks off? Um, I don't know if I get it. <laughs> You've never heard I mean, that phrase before? <laughs> it, it would it would have played a little better in maybe the 60s. Oh, Well, I don't know. I thought you were trying to connect it to the story right now. Like, is it an ad for Arthur George? Oh, like fashion? No, 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 no. I just, I thought Rejoice was overdone. So I was testing out new overdramatic statements. But apparently this one's old. (laughs) At first I had in here that people were going to get an adrenaline rush from it. And I thought that was too much. So just, you know, come up with something else for next week. I'll let you know what I think. <laughs> yeah, it's here in the notes you crossed off. It's the bee's knees. So at least you moved a little bit in the right direction with this. <laughs> Microsoft Advertising launched a cookie-based experiment this week, and it is not my experiment from the weekend when I ran out of brown sugar and just tried to double the regular sugar. Um, that doesn't really work, people. No, you need food coloring. One drop of each, and you get the brown sugar. <laughs> no, I found out the hard way that that's how you make those like really sad flat cookies. <laughs> anyway, this is for campaign experiments. So previously you had to use search-based experience, meaning if you were experimenting with ad copy or creative, if someone saw your ad once, they could see one version of your ad. And then if they saw it again, they could see the second version of your ad. But cookie-based experiments make it consistent by tracking those users and making sure that they see the same ad both times. This is already available on Google ads. So now if you're doing similar experiments on Microsoft, you can use the cookie based option. Okay. And next up for me, insert shops. Oh no. We'll put it in post right here. Oh no. (laughs) Because correlation. (laughs) Listeners know about that yet. Well, they'll know it's, it's just a running thing for Shep has the absolute world's best soundbite where she hears something on the show and we'll go oh no and we just have this mp3 in our slack channel whenever anything bad happens shops oh no and it came out yesterday jess for uh for a client it we, did we heard it was happening and i dropped the shops oh no on everybody oh and i didn't even know you don't even know wow um, so anyway that's what the oh no is and i'll put it in again right here oh no oh no correlation is back I don't know how deep of a dive you guys want me to do on this, but there was a study that came out from Brian Dean and Backlinko. How how deep do you want me to go on this? I mean, it's a light news week. Like Mariana's Trench deep. Okay. Well, let's kick it out to the ocean here because Brian Dean over at Backlinko on Twitter and Backlinko.com had a new post that was called, We Analyzed 11.8 Million Google Search Results. Here's what we learned about SEO. This was a study-ish element that looked at correlation with search results. There has always been this back and forth between is correlation good? What can we learn from this? Obviously, it's not causation. Are there any tidbits we can take from this? And it's been a kind of hot topic for some reason. It's mainly like what we talked about last week. SEOs just can't have anything nice. So just to start. (laughs) Terrible. It's true. I think it's always a, a heck show and you can never just say thank you for the information and whatever. And I think there's a few things with this that I would have changed if I was Brian, but I appreciate anytime somebody puts out some findings. Sorry, he went through and analyzed these results and put it out there and there might be some things that could be helpful, but for sure there is nothing that is causative here, right? So that's the one thing of note. But when he tweeted it, he wrote, we analyze 11.8 million Google search results. 
here's what we learned about SEO. Important, domain rating, short URLs, page authority, comprehensive content, backlinks. Not important, schema, site speed, word count, title tags. Tweets are, are tough and everything, but I think most people really got a little riled up because of the tweet. I mean, you have 280 characters. You can't, you can't, you're not Shakespeare with these things. There's a lot that was in there. Specifically, there's, um, there's a full findings of how the information was pulled at the end. But I just want to pull a few things away from the article that could be, could have been done better. And before I even say this, I'm a big Brian Dean fan. The content that he makes, Shep, how many, how often do I share a piece that he, he wrote? And we're talking about like what, this week with um, table of contents out there? All the time. And I have his um, how to write a blog post article bookmarked on my desktop. Nobody makes better content than Brian. And I think out of everything that people do, the direct result of what Brian has done in Backlinko, people make way better content now, thanks to his teaching. So there's a lot of positivity here, but there were a few issues with this that I had. The first thing is that, again, this is all correlation data. There's nothing, there's no findings that you can really have on this to say, go do this. But from the article specifically, I'm going to read a passage that was here with the key takeaway at the end. So Brian wrote, whether comprehensive content directly impacts rankings is unclear. It could be that Google has an inherent preference for content they deem comprehensive, or it may be that users are more satisfied with search results that give them a full answer to their query. As this is a correlation study, it is impossible to determine the underlying reason behind this relationship from our data alone. Key takeaway, writing comprehensive, in-depth content can help pages rank higher in Google. You can't make that a key takeaway. Again, this is a core, this is not causative. And you just said whether the comprehensive con- content directly impacts rankings is unclear. Saying these key takeaways that back up like your case in everything that you preach this is not factual, right? You just said it's unclear. And then you said the key takeaway is you can you can help pages rank higher in Google. You could say it can help pages rank lower in Google too. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's almost like he should have just said key correlation. There's a relationship between this and that, I guess. You, you the, can't yeah. a step further and guess why. The pro- and it's, it's one step even further back than that, Shep. It's that there's not a key takeaway. It's yeah. be like... Out of the, the the top search results listed, we found that the, there was a correlation between length of content and rankings. Another thing that was in there was it said, we found that domain diversity has a substantial impact on rankings. It's like, yo, this is a correlation. <laughs> you can't say subst- substantial impacts on rankings. Like that's not what the study is doing and that's, again, where I think some people might have some problems. The second thing is that tweets, like, it's hard. You did 280 characters. If you recall in that tweet, he said things not important, title tags and site speed. I mean, people took a lot of umbrage with that. But from the title tag perspective, again, I'm going to read something from the article. He says, it appears that a keyword-rich title tag may be a ticket to entry that can help you get to the first page. However, once you're on the first page using exact keyword in your title, doesn't appear to help you climb the rankings. Yeah, guess what? If you're on the first page, you're generally doing all right from a search engine standpoint. So saying that it's not important and that it's and that it is ticket to entry, you can't say that it's not important. You just said it's a ticket to entry. If I can't get in the door, that's pretty important. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. I'm trying okay. to think how he could have rephrased this tweet, though, and I don't even know. I would, I would yeah. have not said what's important and what's not important. I would. That's have the problem. That. That's the problem. And in in all honesty, it would have helped to, to maybe try to get a few less RTs on that tweet and maybe say, you know, not make it so clickbaity or tweetbaity or retweetbaity or whatever you do, and maybe it's saying overly optimized title tags. You know, or you just say, we, here we have a study. It's all correlation. You know, here, you, I'd like you to take a look. The problem is he's got link, backlink in his name. He's trying to get backlinks. He's trying to get shares. <laughs> I think the tweet really caused this because people do look up to him. I mean, he's got like 100,000 followers. And you're saying not important is title tags. When in the article, you're saying title tags are ticket to entry. And then lastly, when it said speed is not important, you can't say that. You can't. 
see that at all. So he's saying, does site speed correlate with actual Google rankings? Well, he's only looking at the first 10 listings. So you're looking at the top of the listings for these, these queries. They're probably optimized well, right? The content's probably good. It's people that probably know what they're doing. Sites that are probably decent. You're not looking at the bottom sites and the sites that aren't ranking. You're looking at the top 10. I think people are going to look at that the wrong way and say, oh, I saw that this tweet said speed is not important. Site speed is not important. You are only looking at the top of the top, the cream of the crop. Like that's what it is. You, a key takeaway he said was the average Google first page result loads in 1.65 seconds. However, we found no correlation between site speed and Google rankings. That's incorrect. He didn't look at all the Google rankings, right? He, he's looking at the first page rankings. So what it should have said would be key takeaway, the average Google first page result loads at 1.65 seconds. However, we found no correlation between site speed across the top 10 ranking URLs on the search engine results pages. Maybe I'm getting too far into it, but in general, I applaud him for doing this study. I saw Brian put out a tweet and just to, to be positive with this, thank you for the report. It'll be in the show notes. You got a back link from us and we'll, I'll follow up with the tweet that he said, is <laughs> saying, um, he said, Maz's early ranking factor correlation studies were super eye-opening for me when I was first learning SEO. They weren't useful in the sense they influenced my strategy that day, but they got me thinking in new ways in running SEO experiments. And like, that's what these reports are for. So thank you for that, but take it with your own grain of salt. And then just follow up on this after this was put out. Gary at Google said, ranking-wise, site speed is a teeny tiny factor, very similar to a secure site ranking boost. Obviously, there was a bunch more. Martini Buster, a.k.a. Roger Monty over at Search Engine Journal. He's taking no prisoners this week, by the way. Oh, my he wrote the piece. <laughs> We'll get to that in the social section. But he wrote the piece saying, why well, Google correlation studies are unreliable. And in the article, he said, correlation studies have always been unreliable, yet many people continue to believe in them. They make great clickbait. But perhaps it's time for the SEO industry to grow up and set them aside. I'm, I don't, I don't have a problem with correlation studies. The problem is when people think that it's, it's, a, it, it is causation, and that would be my rant over. And then lastly, this all happened back in 2011 at SMX Advanced. Rand Fishkin of said Moz studies showed a correlation between Facebook shares and higher rankings. And then later that day, Matt Cutts said that they didn't see the data that they couldn't see that share data anywhere. So that was kind of the first big blow up. And I'd say there's been many more since then. And this is just the most recent one. And you can see it all over in our show notes at marketingoclock.com. Now it's time for this week's take of the week. This is a hashtag fire digital marketing take with extra spice served up for you. We simply deliver the take for your consumption. We give no opinions. We don't influence. You make the call. All right. And this week's take comes from Colin Slattery and, well, actually, really Dwayne Brown in a response. And Colin said, hey, hashtag PPC chat friends was wondering if anyone had any good research tools, volumes, competitor ads, et cetera, they'd recommend on using SEMrush, aka SEMrush. I added that part in for years. And I'm routinely underwhelmed at the quality of their data. Wow, shots fired. I shouldn't, maybe I should have pre-vetted the initial tweets. And then he said, really looking to make a switch. Dwayne had responded saying, every minute spent trying to understand competition is a minute spent following and not leading. Most of these tools are always off. This is one thing I tell clients we won't spend time on. This is the kind of thing that people would retweet just with the caption, this period. Yeah, it's very this worthy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, think, like. I just like data in general. I don't know. I mean, I, it's a it's a hot take. I like it. It's, it's, it's a strong one. And now it's time for this week's I See Why Am I. This is something you just might not have seen. Maybe something that you overlooked, but you shouldn't have. And this week's I See Why Am I comes from Owen, who is Rebelytics on Twitter, at Rebelytics on Twitter. And Owen says, and this is a little bit of like a drag -em move here, but let's stay positive. And it's funny. So he says, we analyzed 11.8 million Google search results. Here's what we learned about SEO. Important. Use your own judgment. Don't believe everything you read. Correlation does not equal causation. Not important. SEO Twitter. Domain ratings, authority, or whatever metric tool inventors 
tool vendors invent. This. <laughs> <laughs> I like that he said his tweet was important. I just like a little <laughs> self-deprecation. I also like that he used the does not equal sign that saved him a lot of characters, and I wouldn't know how to do that. Oh, wow. Good point. We need to learn that. Special characters love to see it. All right, thank you, Owen. Now it's time for this week's lightning round. Pew, pew. At this point in the show, we split up our content into three parts. Paid, organic, and social. This week's paid lightning round is brought to you by Optio. Optio makes managing Google Ads account simple and efficient. It automates time-consuming manual tasks so you can spend more time on strategic or creative work. It's really like your own personal assistant. That's what I think of Optio. I'm telling people all the time, people I meet out on the streets back when we we're out on the streets, that Optio is like, I don't even need a virtual assistant anymore. I don't need an assistant. I've got Optio. They send me emails all the time when something abnormal happens in campaigns. I can quickly hop in. I can see exactly what is going on. Don't have to log into the Google Ads account. Specifically, just pop on the email, see what's happening, get it taken care of, or and most likely, probably just forward it on to Jess or Shep. Because that's what I do all the time. I just at five in the morning. Well, I see it. I'm like, oh, just just so you know. <laughs> but then I look at it too. We work we work it through. So, Shep, how do you use Optio other than answering my emails? So Optio will make recommendations for negative keywords that they think you should add to campaigns. So they'll tell you the keyword when they make the rec- recommendation, and they'll also tell you how much you spent on the keyword conversions, if you have any, and the CPA plus a list of search terms that your ad showed with that term in the search term. And this is nice because when we do our keyword, go through our keyword report every week, we're looking for terms that show that the wrong intent is there and we should exclude them. But we're not always looking at the big picture in terms of like CPA and maybe we should just exclude this term because it doesn't have a great return. And this is looking at the big picture for us. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And and the thing you might think of is like, oh, I've seen many recommendations from Google Ads and I don't need this. You're wrong. And I will tell you the recommendations that you get from Google Ads are nothing like what you see with Optio. Jess, you were on a call with me once when we had a client that was a Times Square attraction, attraction for Times Square. And they told us to exclude the zip code of the actual location where it existed because there were a lot of clicks. Do you remember that call, Jess? Yeah, it's one of my favorite horror stories. I tell it every Halloween. So anyway, if you want to learn more, give it a test. Six-week free trial. Hook it up to your account. See what negative keywords they start recommending. Head on over to optio.com forward slash S-E-J. That's O-P-T-E-O dot com forward slash S-E-J. First up in paid this week, Dennis Moons, who has like a Greg Finn Twitter handle. He's just at Dennis Moons. Very convenient for us. Wait, you could get Christine Zernheld. Yeah, but I don't really want to. That's not her <laughs> name. It's Shep Zernheld. <laughs> well, you got that one. That's that's just a long Twitter handle. I have a weird name, so Shep Zernheld it is. So anyway, he tweeted this week that he's already seeing free shopping clicks in his Merchant Center reporting, Center reporting which is awesome. These are already... The organic shopping results are already displaying in the wild. We saw a lot of reports on it this week. So they're also coming into Merchant Center, which is great. You know that Dennis and I also share another thing other than an awesome handle. Can I guess what it is? Yes. Okay. Do you both like knives? (laughs) (laughs) But I've got clients that have the Merchant Center reporting and it's pretty awesome. Oh. I'm actually going to talk about it a little bit later. Okay, great. So next up, we have another discovery by Sir Stephen Johns at Stephen Johns 21 on Twitter. 21 got another one. Yep. And this one is about discovery ads. So they have a new layout change for adding responsive creative. Um, It's like a little red box with the ratios in there. It's kind of hard to understand if you're not looking at it. I don't use discovery ads and I don't see this for any of my other responsive image ad formats. So I apparently don't have this yet. As usual, Stephen Johns is head of the game. I just think this example he has of like a lawnmower where he has it cut off like it should be a square image and he's trying to make it a rectangle. It like would look more like a race car or something. Like it doesn't look like a lawnmower. (laughs) It is. Stephen, don't cut the handle off of the push mower. People need that. Don't do it, Stephen. Okay. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) 
Google released an annual report that says it took down 2.7 million, quote, bad ads in 2019 that violated their ad policies. They also terminated the accounts of more than 1.2 million publishers and removed ads from over 21 million web pages across its publisher network for policy violations. You know, this is just not what I like to hear. You know, we're getting some more uplifting news lately. I don't like to hear about these bad guys up there, out there with their bad ads. But they're gone. And, yeah. The company says one of the biggest offenders last year was phishing attempts targeting people looking to renew their passports. Like, that could have been me or you. Just clean up your act. And it also cracked down on, quote, trick to click ads. Do you know what those are? Is it that new thing they released last week to see who is actually behind the ads? Where you trick them to get that click? No, it's ads that are designed to look like computer or phone system warnings and they trick you to click. The Catch most you. obnoxious ads on the internet. And they flash and they're like, you have a virus. Those? Yeah. And they're always on something. Whenever there's a download, you have to choose between <laughs> two dozen ads and what the right download link is. Like yeah, not nice. So as you can see, it's a huge effort to keep bad actors out of Google's ad system. I don't know why they don't just call Nick Cage and Hayden Christensen directly and like tell them to just cut it out. Oh my goodness. Nick Cage is a bad actor? He's the worst. I have nothing to say about Hayden Christensen. He's terrible in Star Wars. Oh, I thought you would like was, him too. I, I will say though, I watched a movie, part of it with my kids, and I was plus I was delighted. I almost, re you know what? I rejoiced, Jess. <laughs> yeah. I heard that the voice was Nick Cage of a superhero. It was Into the Spider-Verse. Have you guys ever seen that movie? Yes! yes! It's so good. It is the craziest movie I've ever seen. It's like the most beautiful movie ever. It's insane. But then I the concept is kind of crazy. The concept yeah, it's, is amazing. It's like, um, what is it? Interstellar. It's like Interstellar mixed with Spider-Man. It's crazy. Which one did Nick Cage play? He was the, the black and white fella the noir spider-man did you I, notice that did you know that was nick cage when he came on 100 percent. i had it in my nick cage draft lineup oh you did for a movie. yeah it's a great film i can't believe somebody okayed that movie the thing was like it was incredible it was, i'm surprised you watched <laughs> oh, it with your kids did they get it they had no idea they laughed at the pig but they thought the pig was a rabbit <laughs> <laughs> so no they didn't get it <laughs> why wouldn't they okay it because it was good the they didn't put any re any like restrictions on the art, like the level of art that was going on in there. It's crazy. Like usually you get a superhero movie and it gets like dumbed down. It's like milk toast. If you've seen any of those Spider-Man movies, they're just horrific. Most of those Marvel movies are unwatchable. This is the part where Hope usually chimes in and screams at you. No, those Spider-Man movies are terrible. <laughs> and then you see this one and it's like they tried. It's crazy. Yeah, it was really good. It has a pretty good soundtrack too. Okay, moving on. Google is hitting control Z on another upcoming change. So they tweeted this week, the final day to adopt parallel tracking for video cam campaigns has been extended indefinitely. We will provide an update on a later date. And if you guys don't remember, parallel tracking brings people directly to your landing page when they click on one of your ads while measurement happens in the background. And this decreases the load time of the landing page and leads to a better overall user experience. And it's already happening in your search, shopping, and display campaigns. It just wasn't mandatory yet. In video, it was going to be mandatory. Now we don't know when that's happening. I love the, you know, the paid section every week is just unreporting something we reported a couple months ago. <laughs> Did you guys notice that? Yeah, it's great. It's great. So hopefully we have some more interesting stuff in organic. This week's organic lightning round is brought to you by Ahrefs. So Ahrefs can give you full visibility into your site. All the backlinks you want to know, what your competitors are doing, what's the most popular stuff out there, what is performing for you, and what isn't. That's the big thing. And just like Optio, you get email alerts for things that go right, go wrong, and you can dial them in to your exact preference. Jess, how do you use Ahrefs? So something really cool you can do with Ahrefs is look at a specific site's post frequency over time. So using the Content Explorer, you can perform a site search on a particular domain and see not only how often the site publishes new posts per month, but also how many times they've republished or updated something. So this is huge if, say, you have a competitor whose content strategy you really admire and you would like to replicate and improve upon. And they have a seven-day trial for only seven 
box. Head on over to hrefs.com to sign up. That is A-H-R-E-F-S.com. Greg, what's happening in organic this week? All right, this week we have a tweet from the Google Webmasters account that is at Google WMC, formerly Webmaster Central, no longer Webmaster Central, but still that handle. And they say, little tweet to Search Console, something many people have requested. What is that emoji they had, the loudspeaker emoji? We use it for our social tweets. It's a megaphone, a A bullhorn. And they say, we're adding a copy to clipboard button, mouse click emoji. Now you may see three icons. It's, are you supposed to read the emojis and report the stuff? Yes. Um. Yeah. Okay. I think it makes for better audio, right? People love it. Yeah, I agree. Your, your heads. Okay. So now you may see three icons when hovering over a URL. Copy to clipboard. Open in a new tab and inspect URL. We hope this small change boosts your productivity. Biceps emoji. Oh, that's one of your new favorite emojis, Greg. The biceps. Yeah, it's the flex, like a strength. So they, they took that for me and they can have it. That's fine. I like their little icon over at Google Webmasters. It's not for me. Like, what about people who would prefer to have, like, strong calves? Well, that's kind of a hard flex, you know, where you're like, oh, look at look at this calf. You just you're point gonna your toe. Point, that's how you, I don't think that's how you flex a calf. You point a toe? It's a way. Yeah. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, this is cool. Instead of just... You know, hopping, opening the page, you could copy it and throw it in whatever tool you want. I appreciate it. Bicep emoji and calf flex emoji to you, Google Webmasters. Next up, YouTube is expanding its fact check information panels to search results pages in the United States. And this comes from not Northern, not Eastern, not Western, but Matt Southern over on Search Engine Journal. And he says, now as more people turn to YouTube for accurate news and information, fact check panels are launching in the United States. And for us, that is, wait, are people turning to YouTube for accurate no. news? I thought this is where all the, the unaccurate news was. Literally, no. Although I think I did watch the election coverage on YouTube the last election because I didn't have cable. But, like, it was a CNN live stream. It wasn't just, like, some YouTube stream. Okay. Well, anyway, the new panels are displayed when a fact-checked topic is searched for in YouTube. And my initial thought is, like, that's got to be, and there was an underlying sentiment that there's some dangerous things out there. There's some bad reporting. There's a lot of hoaxes. There's injection of disinfectants and things like that. And, you know, that probably, if you can save lives, great. But it's also got to be a really tough job. And I was thinking about this. Our Surgeon General in the United States, at Surgeon underscore General on Twitter, said, Seriously, people, stop buying masks back on February 29, 2020, saying they're not effective in preventing general public from catching coronavirus. So that was what the Surgeon General said. I can't believe they started the tweet with seriously, people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So went on to say, use soap and water, stay home, a bunch of helpful stuff, but said not to buy masks. It was preventing the general public. Literally two months later, the Surgeon General put out a YouTube video of how you can make a mask and that communities and businesses are requiring people to wear a face mask to protect people. And he makes a face mask out of a napkin or or I think this might have been a shirt. Yeah. Are you sure this isn't a guide for how to fold a napkin the proper way? No, I watched it. You have two rubber bands at the ends and you put it on. I'm just like, this has got to be an impossible job right now. How do you fact check something? This is like blue check mark Surgeon General saying this doesn't work. And then this is like, then you have a video showing how to make a mask. It's like a crazy time. This has got to be, you. this has to be the most impossible job out there is fact checking live coronavirus information. It's crazy. It's got to be so hard. Yeah, I don't want that job. Yeah, don't <laughs> sign me up. Seriously, people, I don't want it. <laughs> oh, well, so don't sign me up to fold napkins either. These are—I think it was a shirt, though, if I recall correctly. <laughs> Does anyone uh, know, know how to set a table properly, like where the stuff, is, like the silverware, is supposed to go? Yeah, Chef, yeah, that seems like something you would know. I know the bread drink thing. So left is a four-letter word. Fork is a four-letter word. Fork goes on the left. Spoon, five-letter word. Right, five-letter word goes on the right. Knife. Five letter word goes on the right. Wow. Wow. No, I know the one for if you don't know which is your bread plate and which is your drink plate, and you make like the okay symbol with each of your hands. Your left hand makes a B, and that's your bread, and your right hand makes a D because your drink's on your right side. What do you need a drink plate for? 
Yeah, what do you, what do you your drink smell? cup? Like if you don't know which, it's mostly for your drink. Uh, like if you don't know your drink cup is on your left or your right, it's on your right. I think my tip was better. I, I think, think they're both better. useful. They're, they're about <laughs> different things. Like if you're at a dinner, you need both those tips, I guess. Fine oh. dining o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I've got some good news. Podcasts, we are back. The week of April 20th through the 26th was positive for both download growth, up 4%, and audience (laughs) growth, up 2% compared to the previous week. This is the first week both measures were positive since the week of March 2nd to the 8th, according to PodTrack. Oh, wow. People are bored again. Thank God. (laughs) <laughs> we're so bored that we're like just starting to go back into podcasts. I guess it takes seven weeks to run out of ne- all the Netflix inventory. Yeah. What are you guys watching nowadays? I'm watching Little Fires Everywhere. Oh, is that that new series on Snapchat? No. Get out of here. <laughs> Where do you get that? <laughs> it's on Hulu. Um, I read the book. Now I'm watching the show. And Jess is reading the book, I think, right? Yeah, I'm reading the book because Shep said that the show would make me cry, which I actually thought too. So I decided I'd start with the book because it's easier not to cry with the book. On Hulu, I've been watching The Sopranos. I started that finally. They just added that. It's very on brand, Jess. <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> I've been waiting and for it to come to a platform I have access to. <laughs> yeah, next up, maybe you can catch the mash. And next up, we have an old familiar face, Sir Stephen Johns, 21. At 21, got another one has some information on Bing Places. You can now add a COVID-19 update post that will show number one position in Bing SERPs, like GMB, according to Stephen. You can add your GoFundMe link. We talked about that the last few weeks. Additionally, there's an announcement that you can do that will put the updates directly to your customers on your Bing listing. You can do special hours that allow you to put temporary hours while you're keeping your normal hours active. So for businesses that have closed the doors, but not permanently, you can put this on your Bing places so that people know it's a temporary thing. That's super awesome. But by the way, I set that up today, temporarily closed for my business on Bing. And the annoying thing about it is you have to put in a reopen date. Like you can't set it up without one and just say you're temporarily closed. And I, I know that that's optimistic, but right now I don't think anybody knows. So just a heads up, that that's something you kind of have to put in there and you can obviously go back in and change it. But I, yeah, yes, I like, Governor Cuomo doesn't even have a reopen date. How are you going to have one? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I was saying maybe you could get, put, in a, put a phone call into to uh, Cuomo and see when, when you can get that. Give us all some inside information. Perfect. I'll let you know what he says because I'll get him on the blower. <laughs> Next up, YouTube is testing products in this video feature with easy shopping links. And they said to help viewers discover products, we are running a small experiment that will show to some viewers which products are mentioned in the video. I like this. I think there should be more of it, making things easy for folks, especially knowing that we've got a great place to send people to now that isn't just a listing of all ads. It's Google Shopping that has organic in there now. Perfect time for this. Love it. Retweet. Yeah, this makes me think of those... um skincare routine videos they're always like this is the fish face lotion i use from this place it costs 500 dollars a jar and you can buy it here and now you could just link it yep here are my kardashian socks and here's where you can go do you own any kardashian socks i don't i wouldn't actually buy them i just thought it was interesting that all of his siblings brands are there and poor rob they aren't even on shopify oh i didn't even know those were kardashian brands that's how out of it I am. No, the other ones I listed were all the sisters' brands. And then Rob has this sock brand called Arthur George. And they have like fun words written on the bottom, like bring me wine. And they're not on Shopify. <laughs> he got robbed. <laughs> the great <Boy>. show. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Next up, Google said that in order to provide a quicker, more responsive search console experience, some of the reports are now reporting on a smaller number of pages. Specifically, Google's looking at fewer of your pages generating AMP, mobile usability, speed, and all rich reports. And this happened on April 12th, 2020, and that comes to us via Barry Schwartz and Search Engine Land. Next up, Google Meet, the company's premium video conferencing product, is now free for anyone who wants to use it. We, well, Google Meet used to be Hangouts and 
it was pretty unusable for bigger groups a few weeks ago. We tried it. You could only have three people on the screen at once. So unlike Zoom, where you could see this full panel, Brady Bunch style of everybody, you could only get one big person on there. But it's actually great now. I, I enjoy it. It's very nice. If you want to check it out, check go to the show notes, marketingclock.com, and you can see it. I love all the innovation coming out of a time like this. All right, next up, customer engagement company Airship revealed findings from the aggregate analysis of nearly 2 billion app installs. And it shows that notifications have become even more vital during this global pandemic. No! More notification, folks. Send them right over to Shep Zernhold. <laughs> no! Why would you send more notifications? That's terrible. People have more time on their hands. What are people doing? Looking Opening at their notif- phone. That's what, because in March 2020, direct open rates for mobile app push notifications reached their absolute highest average rate in more than four years. And this is one I didn't believe. While nearly one-third of website visits by opt-in users in March 2020 were from direct opens of web notifications. Whoa. That's crazy. But if we all stand together and stop opening these notifications, we can put an end to it. Or you could just disable them, I suppose. <laughs> Next up, we have a tweet from Medahi Ajwada, and he is at Wizzy underscore analytics. Hope I didn't butcher that name too much. But the good thing is he is a fantastic follow if you like analytics on Twitter. And he breaks down the newest release of Google Data Studio. A few things of note. The conditional formatting rules in the new release can be applied to drill down dimensions and optional metrics if those fields are visible. So I love the continued progress on Data Studio. We use it all the time. And again, follow uh, Medhi over on Twitter. Head over to the show notes for that link. And lastly, Amazon has scooped up data from its own sellers to launch competing products. And this is a deep dive by the Wall Street Journal. And said, contrary to assertions in Congress, employees have consulted sales information on third-party vendors when they're developing their own private label merchandise. But don't you think, kind of think everybody does that? Like, you're selling on somebody else's site. Like, if you're selling at a grocery store, they're going to know what sells the most, and they're going to make their own internal brand. Like, that's part of what happens when you are allowing somebody else to distribute for you and sell on your behalf. Yeah. So this is like those Amazon basics and everything. They're just copying everyone else. I guess that makes sense. Why wouldn't you do that though? Like, do you think people, do you think Amazon would, would not do that at all? Like they're going to see what people want. They have all the data and just make that. It's going to be the most profitable. Yeah. You're not Sad wrong. for those retailers though. God, like if you're selling things on Amazon, you're beholden to them. You are at their will, right? Like, mm-hmm. so that's why all the time we say, you know, build on the land that you own. You know, when you do this, you are stuck with the results and good or bad. And most of the time it's bad. And unfortunately, that's just how the world works. Wow. I got really dark there for a second. <laughs> <Sad>. <laughs> All, right. All right. Lighten us up here, Jess. All right. We've got a lot of social stories this week. It's like a Ben Franklin worthy lightning storm. So <laughs> here we go. First up, congratulations to TikTok. The platform has reached 2 billion downloads. So insert yay and clapping sound effects here. I don't know about you guys. I'm still not one of them. And neither is Daniel Day-Lewis, according to The Onion. Did you guys see that meme? I saw the headline, but I don't think I got the joke. Yeah, why don't you explain it to the audience? So the headline says, Daniel Day-Lewis holds thumb over sign up button, hesitates, closes out of TikTok. Again, this is from The Onion. I don't know if there's anything to get. I just thought it was funny because Daniel Day-Lewis is such a serious actor. Like, why would he be on TikTok? Is there something I'm missing here? I just thought it was funny. Yeah, I guess like, why Daniel Day-Lewis? Why not Daniel Day-Lewis? <laughs> what else is he doing right now? He's a method actor. He's, he's, maybe he's going to be in a film about the youth. So he's trying to figure out TikTok. <laughs> those are my favorite stories of what Daniel Day Lewis did for those roles. Do you ever hear that where like he didn't get out of a wheelchair and stuff? It's crazy. Yeah, and he gained like a hundred million pounds for one role, and then like almost you know got himself sick, not eating for another role. I mean, that man's serious, and he's good too. I only know him as Abe Lincoln. Really? He was in that Last of the Mohicans film. 
don't know it. I wouldn't either if it wasn't for my husband. Every like two weeks, he just puts the one scene on YouTube where the guy falls off a cliff. It's <laughs> like what? he loves the soundtrack. <laughs> soundtrack of what did you say? Dances with Wolves? No, Last of the Mohicans. It's the same oh. film. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> we'll stick with TikTok, though. They have launched donation stickers, which support a range of causes, and they can be added to videos and live streams on the platform. So if one of those 2 billion users now clicks on the sticker, they're taken to an in-app window where they can submit their donation. So it's very nice. You don't have to leave the app, and you can donate to charity. So that's yeah. cool. I like it. I hope it sticks around. Haha. <laughs> so, something else you'll like then Instagram has a new donation feature too. It's not a sticker, but the platform now allows users to actually create a fundraiser with Instagram Live and raise money again for the nonprofit of their choice. Social media today called it a small scale telethon, which I thought was really cute and got me thinking like, I can't tell you the last time I've seen a telethon. And maybe it's because I don't have real TV anymore, but they're not really still a thing, are they? Telethons? It's it's like a whimsical thing now, <laughs> where, where like people do it online and they overblow it and make it look like it's in, from the eighties and stuff like that. I see it every, maybe once a year. I see it, but it's mainly an internet based thing, not on TV. But I'd they watch have that. phones with cords and stuff. Like there's call banks or whatever. That sounds so fun. It seems fun. I don't know if I you just Google telethon, you can see rows and rows of celebrities with telephones. It's really fun. The day we plugged in our digital antenna, the only channel we could get was this Lawrence Welk telethon, and I watched it for like 30 minutes. It was great. Did you call in? No, it was from the 70s. Oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> Lawrence still around? I don't think so. No, he's definitely not still around. <laughs> what, if, what, if, what if they're still showing the number and people are just hammering that number? <laughs> like, wait, this phone number only has five digits. Lawrence, where are the rest? I have to give you my money. It was just like a replay, and I'm really glad because they had like all the Lawrence Welk show actors' kids like doing entertaining things and like singing songs with their family for Christmas. It was so heartwarming. Aww. Lawrence is just there, like, yeah, talk to the operator. <laughs> See, tell him, promise to connect me through to number 11. <laughs> 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 You forgot to go, mmm. He always used to say that at the end of his words. Yeah, it's going to knock your socks off, kids. Mmm. <laughs> okay. Oh, what's next? Susan went a grad of Aim Clear and SEJ fame. She spotted some new things with Facebook lead ads. She's at Susan E. Dub, D-U-B, on Twitter. If you want to see screenshots of this, we'll also have it in the show notes. But there's been a design refresh to the forms page, as well as they've added a messenger option for leads. And the ad copy areas that are displayed to users and the next button associated with that are now rounded. She's only seeing that in some accounts. She's not seeing it everywhere, but it's a nice, well-rounded offering. Har, har. Great. I'm laughing on the inside. <laughs> no, you're not. But thanks for lying to me. <laughs> All right. Something interesting from Bloomberg Media, their new self-serve ad tool, Boost, quote, automatically converts ads designed for Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter into banners on its mobile platform. So that's a neat idea in theory, but it's super terrifying that you can just take ads that are made specifically for one platform and put them into another in a completely different format. So it's been a while since we've talked about bad marketers on this show, but that one's for them. Can yeah. I go into their terminal? I want my Instagram ad in your Bloomberg terminal over there. I don't even know what that means, but I'll call Boost and see. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, for the good marketers in the house, which I know are all of our listeners, Sprout Social has released a report on the best times to post on social media during COVID. And spoiler alert, it's not the same as the times before the pandemic. So to be clear, this is refreshingly not a guide on how to post on social. It's a report on when platforms are seeing the most engagement so you can schedule your posts accordingly. Definitely worth a glance. Is it like 3 a.m. because everyone's sleep schedules are off? No, it's actually weirdly, like, I, I don't remember which platform. I think Facebook was like 11 a.m., which I guess, you know, when you're having your dessert breakfast and you want to scroll through, <laughs> it makes sense. I'm going to take a look at it. There's cool graphics. It actually compares the times now during COVID when there's the most engagement with the times that were the average prior to this. So you can see where the differences lie. It's it's pretty nice. What did you have for dessert breakfast today? Um, I had three pieces of candy. 
Okay, so last week we talked about Puff Daddy's Instagram dance parties, and if he wants to move the party over to Facebook, he'll soon have the option to basically charge admission to the live streams. What about Brother Love? A.K.A. Sean Puffy Combs, A.K.A. P. Diddy. Diddy? Yeah, Yeah. all the same. He can charge admission too. (laughs) And it's not just for celebrities either. Facebook announced that they plan to add the ability for pages to charge for access to events with live videos on Facebook, anything from online performances to classes or professional conferences. So that's nice. If you're offering content that you want to maybe make a little money on, that will soon be a thing. And on the free video side of things, Zoom can just move over because Facebook is also introducing the ability for users to create what they're calling rooms in either Messenger or Facebook proper, and they can host up to 50 participants with no time limit. And rumor has it, Greg, that this is also coming to Portal. So get excited. Very (laughs) excited. You have to say it. You say it better than I do. What? Facebook rooms? No, Portal. (laughs) Oh, Facebook portal. (laughs) There it is. I missed that. All right, keeping the Facebook news rolling here, users in the U.S. and Canada can now transfer their Facebook photos and videos over to Google Photos with just a few clicks. And this was already available in some other countries. I believe it started in Europe, but now it's here, and there's obvious benefits for brands here. You'll be able to move assets to a central location. Again, say you uploaded it to Facebook first. Now you can put it in Google Photos and access it from elsewhere. So that's nice. That's awesome. Yeah, Not right? Different. Exactly. I use Google Photos as a person. Shep, you must too because you're excited. Yeah. It's always great when um, you open Google Photos and it like recognize people's faces that you have pictures of a lot and it's like people that you aren't really talking to but you're taking screenshots of their Facebook pictures and sending them to other people. <laughs> oh, no. <and> just <laughs> feel like a terrible person. <laughs> wow. I was about to agree with you and then – Absolutely not on that. My favorite thing is when you take maybe a half dozen photos, but the same face is in the background. And because it's in six pictures, you see this rando in the back of a photo. It makes me, it brings so much joy to me. I'll grab a couple off of my phone and put it in the show notes. It is the best thing. It's one of the top things in my life. Yeah, that's fun. That's more funny. That's not a source of shame. Yeah, that's like by accident. (laughs) Shop, I'm a little worried about what you're up to. (laughs) No, you're not because I send the pictures to you. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Then I guess I know exactly what you're up to. (laughs) It finds like the dolls from Facebook Marketplace. It like knows who they are. That is so creepy. Yeah. And it makes them like a little album, right, is what it does with it. Wow. Only the really lifelike ones. So do you have it like broadcasting all your photos to a, a device like in your kitchen and then the dolls just no. pop up? Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> I can. I kind of want it to be a thing. Okay, maybe I need to do that. Perfect. Thank you. Invite me over when this is all over. I want to see. All right. Speaking of spooky things, here's a headline from The Verge. Google shuts down an event organizing experiment as local meetups disappear which sounds really scary, but it's not. The experiment they're referring to is Shoelace, and it's an event organization app that Google had been testing. And they said, this is a quote, while we're very proud of what we've built and learned, the team has decided that now doesn't feel like the right time to continue investing in this project. That makes sense. So if you were using the app, it's going to shut down on May 12th, and you also probably got an email letting you know. They just bought this thing. We reported on it like a year ago, right? Yeah. Times have changed, like Bob Dylan said. Well, it's not going to be forever, Google. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they'll resurrect it. Ooh. I feel like maybe it was just a failure and they're using this as an excuse. Well, throw it in the Google graveyard. All right. Lastly here from Roger Monte, excuse me, Martini Buster. Facebook is rolling out what they're calling care reactions on both Facebook and Messenger as a new way to show support during COVID. And I don't see them in my account yet. So if you don't either and you're curious what they look like, you can hop on over to the show notes and take a look. Or you can just ask the Martini Buster who likens one to a stuffed bear with a heart, which is a symbol of a last minute Valentine's Day gift. He's really cute. (laughs) Roger was coming in hot on the story, though. Yeah, he had a lot of strong opinions. He also he called the other reaction a throbbing purple heart that resembles Warner Brothers cartoons. That's all folks logo, which made me laugh. But I don't see it. It looks more like the I love Lucy thing to me. Yeah, he, he didn't pull any punches this week. He said the throbbing purple heart emoji creates an expectation of Porky Pig bursting it out. 
bursting out of it screaming, that's all, folks. <laughs> if only. They should really consult Martini Buster before they launch any more reactions. Yeah, and I also like the fact of how we ended that, that post. Did you guys read that? Yeah. He said, at the end of it, he had a heading called Facebook Care Emojis. He said, it's frustrating to be in quarantine, period. People want to return to normal life, period. Facebook, quote, care, end quote, emojis are rolling out to Facebook app and the website proper and messenger apps. I'm like, he's just like, yeah, it's a tough time. <laughs> we don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. And uh, that's all here, too, folks. And that brings us to our real life segment, straight out of our accounts and into your ear holes. It's time for Working Hard or Hardly Working, where we talk about what's going on in our IRL work, good, bad, or otherwise. Chep, what's been happening with your accounts lately? Okay, so I'm delayed on this, but I finally ha- found out how to make GIFs from screen recordings, and I think it's super helpful for blog posts and tutorials and sharing with clients. So I'm going to share the site that I use with the class. It's called easygift.com. It's not gifts of my husband and his initials. It's just any GIF you want to use. So you upload your screen recording, and what's awesome about it is you can trim it. So I was all worried about making GIFs. It was going to like know when you were turning off the screen recorder in the upper right side of your screen. But I mean, it's 2020, obviously. So they figured out how to fix that. And then you can also crop it. So you can crop out if you're doing your whole screen, you can get rid of like your navigation bar or whatever. So it's awesome. Check it out. That sounds great. Do you know if it works with GIFs too or no? Um, No, it's GIFs only. So this week, I have a feature request for Google Ads. If you are in the search terms tab in the main interface, it is not possible to filter the search queries based on keywords that are only currently active. You can do it if you're using the reporting feature in Google Ads, but it takes a couple extra steps, and it would just really be nice if it was there in the main interface view. So Google, if you're listening, it would be super, super handy if we could filter the data in the search terms tab based on keyword status. Thank you. All right. And mine, I've got some good news, some news that Dennis Moons might have as well, because Google organic product reports are out. And as we learned earlier, we've got a client where we can see it. And it is just amazing to see this within the Merchant Center. You can see performance and there's now a chart showing, well, I think it's a graph. There's a graph showing unpaid performance. And for this client specifically, It's all the way up to three and a half thousand clicks a day that are coming in. And I'm sorry if that isn't something that is working hard where we didn't have three and a half thousand extra clicks a day for this client's merchant feed. I mean, that is that is the definition of this whole segment here. So check it out in the performance section of your Google merchant account. Now it's time for this week's WTH. Misguided. You're like, who does that? <laughs> Just get rid of it. I'm over it. <laughs> Where we rant, rave, and roll our eyes about a trending digital marketing topic. What are we coming to? Honestly. See what had us asking. W. T. H. This week. Okay, this week's WTH comes from the Twitter account of Disney+. Plus. And I'm not sure if Disney Plus woke up Monday morning knowing how Twitter works, but they definitely know now. So they tweeted on April 27th, celebrate the saga. Reply with your favorite hashtag Star Wars memory, and you may see it somewhere special on hashtag May the 4th. And then they replied to themselves and said, by sharing your message with us using hashtag May the 4th, you agree to our use of the message and your account name in all media and our terms of use here. And they link to their terms of use. And then they followed up again The above legal language applies only to replies to this tweet using hashtag May the 4th and mentioning at Disney Plus. These replies may appear in something special on May the 4th. My God, they're such weenies. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, they took something that was going to be fun and made it so boring. Yeah, this is why we can't have nice things, right? I, I get it. They're a little heavy-handed, but people were really, really hard on them. I know it's Twitter, but people were mean. <laughs> Did you guys notice that the other dumb May holiday was canceled and nobody was talking about NSYNC throughout April? Oh, wow. It's like people forgot. Yeah. People don't even know what time it is. And the people don't even know the day of the week. 
That's well, true. Disney Plus does. <laughs> <laughs> also, I've been really annoying. I woke up the other day and I was like, I texted my sister. I said, April the 27th, be with you. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> this is the dumbest she thing ever. <laughs> Did she like it or is she annoyed? She was annoyed. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> Yeah. Couldn't they just reply to the people whose tweets they liked and ask permission then? I mean, they're a big enough company that enough people are going to say yes and let them do it if they reply the day before or something. Or I, I know, know they're furloughing everybody. Like, hey, just keep a couple people on and respond to these people. <laughs> and be like, hey, can we use this tweet? It's not that hard. The whole thing is bad all around. The fourth is not strong with this one. Oh. Jess, you didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> I sure April the 27th did. <laughs> All right. And now on to our segment segment, the grab bag of the show. And first up, we have hashtag be helpful. And this is a posting over on remoters.net. And there, are, if you're an experienced professional who has been working remotely and is looking for a new job now, you can put your name in, your qualifications, photos of yourself, and you can be up on a little directory, a database of sorts, so that people can search through binders of remoters and find people to hire in a time where hiring is not as prevalent as it was. All right, next up, we have no thanks. And this is Anchor, who we publish this podcast through and get... You know, 1,200 people listen to this nonsense a week. But they are launching a a video conference to podcast conversion tool. So that if you have a video conference, you can then convert it quickly to a podcast. And that's exactly the worst thing we need right now (laughs) is more horrible sounding podcasts out into the podcastosphere. Okay. And next we have a segment called We're Watching um, for anyone who has tuned into the, that basketball show that they're showing on ESPN for two hours every Sunday night, you may have noticed that last week it was sponsored by the Facebook company. I noticed and I thought nobody else cared. And this week, I guess they're undoing this rebrand and it was sponsored by Facebook again. And Gabe Duverge noticed as well, at Gabe Duverge. We're watching. I think I think next week it's going to be Facebook from Facebook, hopefully. Ooh, that would be fun. Or maybe just all caps. Yeah. And uh, okay, next up we have show notes. So SMX Advanced has been canceled. It was going to be early June over in Seattle. It's always a great show. It is canceled. If you had tickets, you can contact registration at Search Marketing Expo to have your ticket transferred to XMX, SMX East 2020 which is November, New York City, or SMX Advanced 2021, which is June 7th through 9th in Seattle. So there also is a new show that they're having that's a virtual show, I believe, called Folks. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> it's, I think it's like SMX Next or something like that. They've been putting out a bunch of good content, though, so follow them over on searchmarketingexpo.com. All right, if you're looking for more great content, SEM Rush, aka SEM Rush, has five hours of content marketing. That's the actual name of the webinar. And it is on May 28th at 13 o'clock sharp. You can head on over to SEMrush.com if you'd like to. And Shep, did you sign up for this? I did sign up. The good news is it's hosted by the one, the only, the pride of Avon, Casey Gillette. And I'm I'm hoping that there's four hours of Casey on this on this webinar. They should just rename it. Yeah, five hours of Casey marketing. Perfect. <laughs> Love it. Go sign and retweet. Ups. Yeah, I agree. Okay, next up, the e summit. Did you guys sign up for the e summit or no? Yep. Okay, it's Search Engine Journal owns e summit and it's searchenginejournal.com forward slash sej dash e summit. And they've got a banging website. Have you guys seen that thing? It's great. <laughs> I only saw the part where I signed up. It'll knock your socks off. Yeah, there's like a. a a thing afterwards too. I lost the link to that, but you can like go mingle, like an online mingler. So. Oh, I, I don't really like the word mingle. Oh, you don't? Okay. No. Well, on other things that you may actually like, did you sign up for the PSAC 2020? Not yet. We talked about that last week. It's a paid search association conference 20, the PSAC 20, if you want to. And we'll have the link over in the show notes. And now for this week's cool tool. 
As a reminder, our Cool Tools segment is not an official endorsement or paid mention. We're simply sharing something we found in our travels that may be of use to our listeners and is really, really cool. This week's cool tool is the keyword generator from Majestic. It's a keyword research tool that works by mining for terms commonly used in relation to a domain or a set of domains. So rather than start with a phrase, you start with a website. And you enter the site or sites that you want to explore, and the keyword generator will return a list of associated phrases along with search volume, keyword difficulty, and frequency. And then you can use these metrics to sort or filter the list and perform a search for a more specific word if you want to narrow down the list to a topic that you're specifically interested in. The only caveat is you do have to have a Majestic subscription to use it, but it's available for all tiers of membership. And if you're just curious about how it works and aren't a Majestic user yet, they have a great article with step-by-step walkthrough of the tool and screenshots shots and everything shows you how it works. It's really awesome. So head on over to blog.majestic.com and check it out. Now it's time for our must read marketing article of the week. An article so advanced, so in depth, so detailed that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on today's show. And this week's must read marketing article of the week comes from Nick Wright over at Local SEO Guide. And the title is called how to scale content production that doesn't suck. And this is one of those pull back the curtain posts that Nick has here. And he has five key elements to scaling content in a way that doesn't suck, which you know I appreciate that. It keeps it light. And there is some basic stuff here, but he has some great insight about finding writers, getting organized, asking questions, providing a style guide, giving feedback, and iterating on it. And I got to say, his GIF game is strong. Shep, you might say his GIF game is strong. I would check it out. It's over on Local SEO Guide. And give him a follow. He's got a good Twitter handle, too. You can tell he's just, he's he knows content. It's called Rightius. So check it out in our show notes if you want to give Nick a follow. Thank you, Nick. All right. That does it for today's show. Thank you to our fantastic sponsors, Ahrefs and Optio. And if you're looking for Another great marketing podcast. Don't miss this week's episode of the Search Engine Journal Show. And this week it's Bill Hunt getting nitty, getting gritty about cities and countries and other things with the Ahrefs Lang Show. So if you're an international SEO, you're going to love this one. If you're one of the couple dozen folks that are geeks about Ahrefs Lang, there's no better content than this week's show. So don't miss it. It is now officially not Marketing O'Clock. Remember, you can catch everything from this show on marketingoclock.com. And while you're there, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And we will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Marketing O'Clock. If today's show was of value to you, please subscribe, leave a review, or share with a colleague. If you are looking for more information on today's topics, head over to marketingoclock.com for links to all the articles that we covered.